Welcome back to America's Frontline. Today we're talking about the war in Gaza, and we have on with us retired Lieutenant Colonel Fred Peterson. He is a Vietnam veteran as well as Desert Storm veteran. His expertise are in communications, military strategy, among a myriad of others, and um, it would it would the list is too long, <laughs> and and. There are too many accolades. Uh, we are just happy to have you here um, to give us your thoughts on, uh, you know, some of the issues that uh, are surrounding this war that um, is very steeped in uh, moral issues. Um, it's something that's uh, it's very nuanced, and and so you know, to get your insight on this is, um, I think, important uh, and very much appreciated. So thanks for coming on. It's an honor to be here. I'm in very good company about that and uh, look forward to exploring these issues and uh, hope we're having some effect. Uh, our insights, I think, will be uh, valuable, we hope. Uh, let's make our contribution and let the uh, market decide. <laughs> will <laughs> that do. That sound too libertarian or what? <laughs> <laughs> will do. I think to start this off, um, one, there's, there's a lot of spin in the media um, on both sides of this, uh, you know, directing, uh, you know, a certain narrative one way and a certain narrative the other way. There are, you know, pro and anti on both sides. And I think it's important that we get a general knowledge of the landscape first. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start with that and, you know, Ken, if you could maybe take us through some of the history surrounding um, the area, well, I, I think it's a good place to start. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that the basic argument here is over who is the indigenous people and a, a couple facts that, that should be known is that the term Palestinian people or Palestinians was actually created by Arafat 57 years ago, which was around the time that Israel was created and the separation occurred. Um, genetically speaking, uh, the Palestinians are not a homogenous group. They're actually a combination of, of a lot, but mostly Bedouin tribes that no longer had the ability to live that lifestyle, the, the trade route lifestyle. So they were largely nomadic. They were they were nomadic in that in that area. General, or? Egypt and, and in a lot of that area. Now, just from recent history, you know that Egypt really is not thrilled about having them come back. Right. So, when, so that's an important fact: is that you have these these nomadic tribes who were spread out throughout the region. That's and correct. you're talking Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and yes. you know, so all the surrounding uh, like regions. Syria and all that. They, okay. they, the problem is that there was, once you created states with borders, mm -hmm. that lifestyle was over. Now, where do you, now what do you do with them? Well, stick, let's stick them over in you know, Palestine, the, the, Israel. And it's been an Israeli problem ever since. Um, so going back as far as indigenous, just, just let's deal with facts. Um, the first historical reference we have to people there is the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. After that, you had, um, before the theocracy, or you had Israel and then the king, kingdoms of Israel and Judea. And then from there, you had Babylon came in and conquered them. Then you, the Persians overtook them. Then you had the, uh, the Alexander era. Then you had uh, the Seleucides, you had the uh, Husmanians, you had the Romans, obviously, that, there's a lot of history on that. Uh, you had the Byzantines, uh, after, or after that you had the uh, Fetiman uh, Caliphate, which is now, now you're starting to see the Muslim influence there. Mm -hmm. uh, then you had the Christian kingdom of, um, it, it, Christian kingdom and the Fatimid Caliphate, kind of jointly controlling the area. 
then you had the uh, Ayyubid, I believe that's pronounced correct. And then you had um, the Islamic Mamluk, uh, Sultan of Egypt, controlling the area. Then you had the British Mandate. And then most recently, you had the state of Israel. Prior to Arafat's comments, or creation of the term, <coughs> Israelites were considered Palest the people of Palestine. Not Palestinians, but the people of Palestine. Uh, the political implications when Arafat created that phrase was to convince the public or convince you know, it was a PR move that the nomadic tribes were the indigenous uh, people to that area. And it just is factually incorrect. So when they, if you, when you look at the propaganda of what's being put out there right now, um, and the media seems to support it, you know, the, and especially our educational system seems to be supporting it, that Palestinians were indigenous to that area. No, they weren't. They were nomadic. And Israel has been there since recorded history began, you know, some 300 years before Christ. So um, that being said, that is, that is the factual history, regardless of any other propaganda. It sounds like we have a whole bunch of people in this, in this area over thousands of years jockeying for space. Eventually, you have... Israel forms a state. Uh, we don't know, uh, you know, what to do with uh, the Arab population. They end up taking parts of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. To an extent, right? Twenty uh, percent uh, of the they offered them of, up. They offered them up to Jordan and Egypt. They didn't want control over them. And twenty percent of inside Israel is Arab population right now. Right. So they're. <coughs> it's not an apartheid state. People choose to be right. separated. And when the Jews were displaced, uh, you know, through, uh, by the Arab nations, uh, the Israel took them in, right? Correct. Okay, so that's basically where we're at now. Not that any of this uh, has any bearing over what should or shouldn't happen as far as, like, defending your people or, uh, you know, invading a country or the atrocities that have happened on both sides. But it's good to have a clear understanding of what is, you know, what are the facts? How did we, you know, get to this point? Because there's a lot of finger pointing going on both ways. And, you know, when it comes, when it really comes down to it, you know, there are moral issues that we're going to get into. And some of that will come back into play. Peace was improving in that area, more so than ever. They were, they were, they were on the verge of signing a new agreement between Saudi and Israel, a peace agreement. Funny how this broke out right at the point at which they were supposed to consummate that deal. Hmm, maybe, you know, maybe Iran didn't want that to happen. Maybe Iran is pulling the strings of through proxy, causing these things to happen and letting these people be injured because of their desire to not have peace in it. You know, they want instability. They don't want stability because it doesn't serve their purpose. That's, you know, again, there's no coincidences. Right. Well, there was, you know, uh, there, there's been a couple of peace accords you know, and the and the Oslo Accord, uh, Israel comes to the table every time. Yes, these terrorist groups, they're not. Uh, you know, so what do you do? <laughs> what happens, right? Well, we see what happens. You know, I mean, this war has been going on a cyclical war. Uh, you know, years at a time for you know since the '40s. Um, you know, but you know what's happened on October seventh. You know, it's it's a it's a terrible thing that happened, and I think uh, the question on everybody's mind, and this is something that I wanted to ask you, Fred, is what is you know by the invasion you know of Hamas, uh, 
<coughs> you know, and the killing of 1,300, the slaughtering, you know, of 1,300, 1,400 civilians, what is the proportionate response from Israel? A very good question uh, that should have uh, a universal response to it. Uh, we talk about a proportionate response, and yet would that response be appropriate in the same fashion that the aggression was committed? What we had was, to call it terrorism is to put a smiley face on, uh, uh, on a pretty hideous event. What we had were children raped and beheaded. We had women being paraded around on the back of pickup trucks, being raped in front of audiences of people. Is a proportionate response a similar event? Absolutely not. And yet, to ignore this invasion and to ignore the facts of what how it was actually executed with hideous in, in, incivility of, of utter uh, uh, uncivilized behavior. Even that is to put a smiley face on. Uh, uh, this, this was one of the most hideous events uh, in history, really. And it went on and on and on and was misrepresented in many ways in Western media that ignored things that were apparently somehow for some bizarre reason uncomfortable to discuss. But the uncomfortability curiously put a hideous face on the aggressors. And now we're talking about a response that will highlight uh, collateral damage as being somehow intended. What was done in the back of pickup trucks paraded around the city was intention. Children beheaded, young infants chopped up and, and in, a, in a fest of uh, just to call it uncivilized, I mean, this is the most brutal, some of the most brutal things that we have heard. And yet that brutality, the details of it, didn't make it to a lot of the Western media. So an appropriate response, what must be done? A government owes it to its own people to defend itself, to protect their people. A response to this hideousness is absolutely required by justice, by self-defense. They must protect themselves. If there is collateral damage, we don't focus on the collateral damage. We may note it, but we don't focus on it. War is hideous. War is ugly. War has innocents that suffer as well as the guilty, but when those innocents become the objective of a tactic and a strategy that is far different from collateral damage, it is an intention, and that is what was done but that's Hamas. during this attack. That's Hamas Precisely. having a war without rules, but there are rules well, to war. And civilians are not to be used as shields. Precisely. Now here's where we come into the nuances of what is the proportionate response, right? We'll take because it you well, have uh, so you uh, have Hamas who, yeah. who uh, perpetrated this horrendous act on innocent people, and yes, IDF has to respond. It's how do they respond when Hamas is using, they're, they're building tunnels and, and housing missiles and weapons and hostages. They have 250 hostages. 
to uh, protect them from response. Americans, yeah. You know, uh, to protect themselves from a response. So how do you, what do you do in this case? You have to respond. You have to protect your people. You have the right to defend your people. But you have what, an obligation to at, defend your people. But you have an obligation to the civilians of this war as well to keep them safe. Well, Both sides do. Just because Hamas doesn't follow those rules, does that mean IDF doesn't follow well, those rules? That's my question. That is my question. My question is, Hamas perpetrated an act beyond terrorism right. in order to solicit a response by Israel in order to achieve a goal. So they could focus on... R correct. Precisely. Now, I hear everybody telling Israel, make sure you follow the rules of war. But they're fighting an adversary that doesn't. So how does that play uh, from, a, from, a, from a war tactical standpoint? How can they be expected to... And they do. And I have to say, Israel goes beyond the call of duty and telling civilians, move out of the area. It's Hamas that blocks them from leaving. But, I mean... At some point, they sent, what, they've sent text messages in advance yep. of a strike. They've, and leaflets. They've dropped leaflets in yep. the advance of a strike. They've given time <clears throat> for a population to move, albeit probably not enough time, but they've given time to move from north to south and say, hey, we're going to, we're going to infiltrate Level. the north. In contrast to the other to side. The south. But... If you know Hamas is holding them there, I mean, how, you, you know, I don't think there's any way you can justify airstrikes on a hospital that are full of people and potentially full of, of Israeli hostages. If that happened. And American hostages. At well, that. if that happened. The, the airstrike. So how do you fight this? That's more of my question. That's why I'm asking you as a strategist, as a military strategist, how do you fight this enemy? Morally, well, there is a very good question, a very difficult one, because the other side, the other side, Hamas, the enemy, shall we say? I think we can share that common definition. I think the whole world has does. looked at and is using the abhorrence of civilian casualties. The the wrongness of not just abhorrence, but the uh, the moral uh, violation of civilian cat. But it's not civilian casualties. Period. What is highly objectionable is not that a civilian may die in in an action, but that. The death of the civilian is intended by the tactic and the strategy of one side or another. Yes, we are obligated to protect, as you noted, Israel has in dropping leaflets, giving warnings. Where were the warnings given by the other side in their attack? None. So we have a very, uh, quite a, an imbalance here in on one side and, and another. Uh, how to respond to this? It is not easy. It, it is not easy. It is extremely difficult by design. Prisoners, as was noted already, are being held in tunnels so that they may become part of the uh, casualty pool, and Israel will then, if the media does not do its job, focuses on the death of civilians, which we can all agree, I am sure, is wrong, is, is, is evil, is bad. Those, those hostages, let's call them hostages, that's, are being terribly abused right now. By the other side, where have you read that in some of the mainline uh, newspapers and uh, media of the West? You, you don't. You, you don't. And yet that is what is happening. They are being totally exploited as a tool of war. How do we go about doing that? 
It will not be easy. It will be ugly. Guess what? What is happening now? The aggression was ugly by intention. The responses that they are requiring in order to address that aggression are also ugly. And that is happening now. This is not going to be, guess what? War is hideous, isn't it? War is ugly. This will be ugly. The question is, do you intend and exploit the ugliness? Or do you attempt to mitigate the ugly part of it, but not relent on your objective? And that is to win, to defend what is rightfully yours, to defend what is right, not just rightfully, but what is right. And as has been noted, the history of the area uh, is quite clear. We have migrant tribes, shall we say, dare we say, less civilized people uh, meander around and, and, and don't have settlements. I mean, to compare one with another and then to call a land belonging to we had in the United States, for instance, without getting too diverting, we're talking about um, indigenous, quote unquote, people. There were three distinct migrations into America across the Straits from Asia that became what we know as American Indians today. But there were three distinct, genetically different tribes that settled in different parts of the continent, both north and south, they became uh, known as the indigenous people. Did the second and the third wave of migration become aggressors? <laughs> Were they, in other words, there is a, a trend and a flow of history here and of civilization. If we look at it in the Middle Eastern context, it's quite clear who settled that area and who was noted for more than a thousand years as being identified with that terrain. And it wasn't migrating people that shifted here, there. It was people who set up a civilization and elevated the land, the economy, and who were shall we say, more advanced? Are we allowed to say that? Yeah, we're saying it right now. And they established a culture and uh, established government and recognized, and in Israel today, there are Islamics within the Israeli government. There are votes and citizenship that is granted to the Islamic members of that government. And where do you find that on the other side? You don't. Where do you find the discussion of the disparity in the Western media? You don't. So let's, so, let's, let's focus back on tactics for a moment. So do you, if, if it were you, if you were responsible no. for the counteroffensive, oh my. <laughs> would, you, would you do what Israel is doing, and that is a focus on, on the Gaza Strip and eliminating Hamas? My belief is you cut off the supply line. So I think I would focus on <coughs> Iran. Um, to I, the degree that achieving one is necessary to do the other, uh, I would say I would agree with you. You, you need to, that is a strategy and a tactic of war. You've got to cut off the supply to the enemy. And, and you've got to go to the root of the problem. Yes. Now that doesn't mean, I, you give Iran a chance. You give them a chance to say, guess what, sweetheart? Excuse me, but this is what's going to happen. You, you, have, you have an opportunity to step back, rethink, and sit down and let's talk about what's going to happen. Do I sound too lefty liberal? But you do what must be done in order to succeed. And that Iran is at... The nub of this the strategic, uh, the st strategic flaw, <clears throat> as I see it, in trying to compromise with Iran is that their particular brand of, of religion, I'll use that Shall word lightly, yeah, uh, 
does not require them to be honest with an infidel. They are not obligated. If you fall for it, then too bad. And so well, you mean can't trust become, what they say unless you can enforce it. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we become, we adopt their lack of standard. It means that we hold them to ours. Well, that's the same accountability that I think my question stemmed from yeah. with the IDF in regards to your military tactics on eradicating Hamas from Gaza. <clears throat> I don't think you can eradicate Hamas with, while Iran has capability of regenerating a new group or funding another in the same area. I don't know what the, num what the statistics are, but at what point... How much does it take of a population to control the majority of the population? Is it 20%? Is it 17%? Because my question is, at what point does the majority of, I'm going to say Palestinians because we don't have another term, uh, at what point do they turn on Hamas or the other uh, terrorist groups in there and say, we're not having this anymore? You could have spent that money and we could have infrastructure and satellite TV and air conditioning and a beach that beats no other that people can surf at. At what point does the populace go, I, we're not taking it anymore? Well, that's 100 percent. Gaza could have been, uh, you know, that could have been uh, big, bright, shiny lights of Las Vegas on Indeed. the Gold Coast. Lebanon Indeed. was at one time. And look at it now. So, you know, while Israel, uh, you know, formed a state and built an empire and, uh, you know, flourishing land of uh, people. Milk and honey. Yeah, and innovation <laughs> and, you know, which is a lot, you know, look at you. U.S. has interests in, in Israel, uh, high tech interests. Yeah. In, uh, Intel, HP, uh, Cisco, <clears throat> among many others, you know, they're, they're an innovative uh, space. Now... Gaza, <laughs> the people of Gaza, I guess we'll call them the Palestinians. Um, they had Residents, a chance to do. Shall we call them? <laughs> they had a chance yeah. to do the same as well. They had funding coming in. Yep. They could have built a metropolis on the coast. And I'm sure if they needed more money, people would have poured it on them. But they were, people. they, and I don't think they chose this. Um, I think Hamas took over, and. You know, I don't know enough about the geopolitical spectrum of uh, the people of Gaza, but, you know, I think they were overtaken by this. And, you know, when Hamas became their government, so you have a terrorist organization now ruling over your people as a government. Are they armed? Are they, are they armed enough to stand up against them, even if they wanted to? Do they want to? I don't know. Could they? Well, they're exploiting the very people they claim to represent. Oh, we know and that. And they are using utterly shamelessly, without conscience, the people they claim to represent, the stage props. They're stage props for their own aggression. And uh, the question is, <clears throat> are the residents of that area, of the, the whole willing to stand up and say no? Or are they just so subject to exploitation by their own, but they're really not their own? Uh, I agree. They, they may have a common religion, but they are not their own. Uh, they're being shamelessly exploited by Hamas and by external forces and uh, that does not relieve Israel of the responsibility to do what must be done to protect Israel, to protect their own, and actually to protect those that live within Israel, both Jewish and Islamic, yeah. which they do. They have... Uh, well, there were thousands of Pal Palestinians... Um, coming, coming over the border, the I think it's Ezra. To find a better life. Ezra, to work every day. Back right. and forth over the border to work every day. To find a better life. And uh, where do you hear that reported? Except on front line. <laughs> well, I mean, where is it reported? Where is the truth? Where is the truth? 
Now that is not to say, I mean, we live in a mortal world, a world of good and evil that uh, all of us are a mixture, except my, <laughs> all of us are a mixture. We try to reach, to, to know the light and to reach up to the light. Some do it much better than others. Israel is doing it quite well not only for their own, but for those residents who live there <coughs> of whatever background. They have an obligation to defend, protect and defend that whatever it takes, because this is indeed a life and death, a struggle of good and evil. And it's a, a struggle that uh, will be decided Unfortunately, shall we say, by arms in the field. There is one side of that equation that operates by relatively higher standards of battlefield uh, behavior, shall we say. And, and there is another side that is operating with an utter hideous um, uh, violation of humanity. Don't we see the difference? Can't we make a choice? We hope and pray that Israel will remain true to the higher standards, but what must be done, the focus must be on winning, because if they were to lose, that means bad behavior has been rewarded, and it will be rewarded behavior increases. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Because what if they it's lose? going to pop up in other places. What if they lose? Like what World Trade Center, what, shall we say. What happens? <laughs> you know, what, what is what, lose? What if, so... Define that. What if, what if Iran, what if Iran decides to jump in this and they push Hamas and Hezbollah and they, you know, shoot money into all the other factions that are surrounding Israel right now? <clears throat> And they... So I think you need to look at the regional implications at that point. Yeah. There's Saudi and uh, Jordan and some of the others. Egypt. Fe yeah. Egypt fear Iran. Sure. They don't want them to get the nuke or anything else, okay? Somebody has to strike Iran before they complete their nuclear program. Right. That has to happen. Saudi and Jordan and, and the others will are in, quietly in support of that. I still believe that the United States' interest, although we do not have leadership that would capitalize on it, I think it would be in the United States' interest to go in and hit Iran because they've been attacking us for the last month. I think we have the right to go in and hit them and take out their military capability and nuclear capability. If you did that... Well, we start, we just, there were just a couple airstrikes yesterday. Yeah. But, from, from us, because they've been attacking But that bases. was in Syria, not in Iran, not down their throat. And let's, I said it before, you cannot have a deal with Iran that you cannot enforce through force. I... And the, there's a great deal of that population, that, like we were just talking about in Gaza, that don't want the current regime. And we have not supported them the last three times they've risen. If we were able to take out enough of their military infrastructure and their capabilities, it's possible that the good people of Iran could overwhelm. A, a, a disturbing element, consideration in this is who is our leadership right now? And A, is it talented? B, is it well enlightened? C, is it courageous enough to do what must be done to achieve the ends you've just described? Uh, I'll leave the question on the table that your listeners must answer for themselves. If we have the right leadership, <clears throat> we have the right tools. We've already discussed how under-equipped, under-supplied, uh, and under-led uh, a lot of uh, the response to that is right now. 
if you engage inadequately, you could well end up losing dramatically. Uh, how about that? <laughs> to, if what is needed is, as you have described, is a, is a, a response that we at our best are and were capable of. Question is, where are we now, and what is likely? What is likely to occur if we fail? in going far enough, I think there are very, I, I don't have an answer to it. I well, think right. there are very dire risks based on leadership, based on leadership right now and determination and value. Well, from a business perspective. Do we have the leadership? Do we have the determination? Do we have the values, the common values that we've had? I'm not sure. And that's quite an admission. If you analyze it from a business perspective, you, of course you want to go back and look at history. Well, we have, we're looking at leadership, so that would be this particular administration. Yeah. The very first act they did was Afghanistan, withdrawal. Okay, well that doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Most humiliating video that, I, I, if that doesn't tear your heart out. Well, considering that Hamas is probably using those weapons right now. Absolutely. I mean, they, the there's money. evidence of that. And the money to buy. And the money. Yeah. Well, I don't remember how many pallets of cash were left there, but um, my, my, again, do we have the leadership? Well, based on history, not so much. But the day before that transition took place, yes. The day before. Precisely. So as a population, we have to start making some better decisions. Well, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to what's happening now. So, what is the I, what is the IDF's uh, strategy right now, um, as far as eradicating Hamas from Gaza? What what do you like? How do we do this tactically? Let's talk. Let's like pinpoint. Let's talk tactics. How do you do that? Do you send in special forces? Um, is this is this a solely a ground war? Um, you know, you how sacrifice uh, uh, hostages. What, yeah, how do you how consider do you, that? I mean, they they're still holding two hundred uh, plus, maybe two hundred and fifty hostages in there, and they will become stage props for by design from precisely, Hamas. precisely. Sure. So, how tactically, how do you handle this? Is this a special? Is it <clears throat> special forces? Is it solely ground troops? Is it? How do you do this? You don't have an answer to that question until you decide what your leadership is and what they are capable of doing. We could come up with a, a speculative response as to we should do this and we should do that. Are we talking the about real, Netanyahu at this point? Yeah. I think. Well, Netanyahu has his own problems. He's got division within Israel at this time right now. He's not fully supported by the Israeli people. It's another political, and we're going through the same thing in the United States. Netanyahu, I, in my humble opinion, uh, is an excellent leader. He's one who has paid the price in uniform, on the lines, not only that, I mean, that's not just an admission to anything, but Disneyland, oh, wait a minute, we wouldn't want to go there, would we, not right more. now? <laughs> but uh, he has also the knowledge and the determination and the values to lead Israel. Why isn't all of Israel following? Why isn't all of America following? I will speculate also that he is being pressured by the United States and our leadership to restrain and uh, abbreviate his own response to a, a, a dire crisis based on American quote-unquote leadership today. Do you think he'll abide by that, or do you think he will? I think I ultimately think, think he'll he stall will. and then do what has to be done. Well, what has to be done? What's the U.S. tactic behind that before we move too far forward? 
What's the U, what's the United States tactic in stalling Netanyahu from? It's his not a response? United States tactic. Uh, this is a tactic of individuals and interests that are running our policy right now, both politically and, and in the military and monetary, precisely, all okay. three. And uh, these are, un, shall I say, almost unprecedented times. And the threat is not just within the United States or within Israel, it's throughout the West. You see this happening in our allied countries as well. We live at a time when we have lost faith. We have lost our ability to define faith and define ourselves. We have lost belief. When you don't believe in something, you will fall for anything. A famous quote here. Uh, not mine. <laughs> but we're falling for anything right now. We're desperately grasping for something. And because we have lost a definition of what we are. And uh, I, I really, I, I can't speculate as to what I can tell you how I think we ought to prosecute an, a, a resistance in Israel to this aggression. But uh, whether that will be done tactically or strategically or not, I don't know because the political leadership and the military leadership is the uh, fulcrum on which success and tactics will be, tactics and success and strategy will be decided. That fulcrum right now is way off balance. It's like trying to balance uh, way out of balance. And I think we're, we're in for some very, very difficult times. Israel can resist, they can win, <clears throat> they must in order to preserve themselves and to preserve what is truth there and uh, what we knew at one point as integrity. But will that be done? I, I am not optimistic. If you were to move to prosecute the demolition of Hamas, the elimination of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, what would be the military tactic? Would it be bombing as they are now, try to, try to, try to remove as much of, of the obstacles and the, and the door to door. But I don't know if they can penetrate deep enough to, to affect the tunnels. Also would be political and uh, military isolation of the opponents. How, the tunnels, <clears throat> That, that's very difficult because of the hostages that they hold. However, uh, that kind of warfare, we, we have means, shall we say, to determine where the tunnels are, how they're networked. There are hostages down there, as you brought out. Um, this is going to get really, really ugly, and it's going to take a lot of casualties in clearing out the nest. But you also not only address this tactically and how to take the tunnel. We can find out with uh, a very costly but successful way to do that. But it's the larger strategy you have to be looking at, too. Who is supporting the people who are there? Not only supporting uh, Hamas, and not only supporting, but who is supporting the, uh, the strategies in the West? And who is, you've got clearly define the sides and find out where the fulcrum of uh, success and failure exists. And I think you pointed out that uh, Iran needs to be addressed and they need to be told by a leadership we can count on. Do we have that? I'm not sure, as we have discussed. Mm -hmm. They need to be told, this will not stand, there will be dire consequences, and we need to not restrain our allies, such as Netanyahu is being restrained right now. They are so needs. arrogant as to come to New York <laughs> on, our, on our territory 
right. and basically read us the riot act in the uh, in the um, New York Times. Well, actually, on on stage in in, in the um, I'm brain dead as far as the um, I want to say League of Nations, but it's not in the uh, UN. UN. Mm -hmm. They came on the floor of the UN. They basically told the U.S., if you interfere, we will strike you and you will pay the price. But they've postured <coughs> like that verbally for decades. Not on our soil and not in the U.N. The, their, <coughs> their, look at their actions, though. I, you think if Iran didn't have a plan and was going to jump in, they would have done it already? Because I, look at the implications. What happens if they do jump in full force right now? Then we're obligated to jump then in we by jump treaty. In immediately i don't think i don't i hope that doesn't happen well they don't want to wait till the next administration but we they have to want find to out before before they change well there is definitely an opportunity right now let's hope they don't take advantage of that i don't know that they would um uh, i guess define what you're saying in more detail so i think the posturing uh the verbal posturing of Iran right of now Iran. is just that. I don't think it's, I, if you look at their actions, they, you know, what are they doing? They're scattered little attacks here and there. We know Iran is capable of way more than what's happening right now. And if they wanted to, they could turn this entire thing into World War III. But I don't think they want that. I don't, I think if the United States acts assertively, we could prevent that. I think that's what they would like to be able to do. Yeah. But I think if we strike to the heart. I think that's what's holding them back from doing it. Yeah. They're not quite But what's sure. holding us back? <laughs> I understand that's what's holding them back. What is holding us back? They have already struck us. They have already insulted us in the UN. So let's all cheer. Let's go, Brandon. I, 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 yeah. Right, but I think that's what I mean. I think there's something different from ver the verbal posturing than the actions of what's actually happening out there. Uh, I, you know, if you're moving, you know, huge battleships around and the missile defense systems and positioning them here and there, when you start seeing, you know, as you know, uh, like the real boots on the ground moving into position, you know, you get a lot clearer picture of like, oh, okay, well, what he said may be different from what he's actually going to do or what he's capable of doing. I think it's all posturing. I think, I think it, so, too. For, I think it makes it so Biden does not have to make a decision. Yeah. If I'm moving pieces around the board, I'm doing something. But look at the global implications. Right now, we have a growing axis power of China, Iran, and Russia. Okay? We are now being forced to engage with two of those forces while China sits unimpeded, okay? While they take up ground around the world, while they eat up infrastructure, while they eat up minerals, while they eat up resources. I truly, truly think that we are playing their game. What has always made America wonderful is the fact that we knew right from wrong. That we, if you hurt us, we're gonna strike you back. And when we strike, it's, to achieve a goal. But the difference is, is that we're content within our borders. We have the resources, we have innovation. Everything we need is right here. We have it. When I ran- We're going to protect it. We don't need to go out and get this here and that there. I will guarantee you when Iran pulls the trigger, when they decide to create havoc, all of those people that cross the southern border, or not all of them, but I, okay, a great deal of the people that came across the southern border, maybe several groups with different intents, all of harm. Those people are not being monitored. You can see it happening in these demonstrations. They're not, those are not spontaneous, okay? When those people are instructed to create havoc, you don't think the United States is going to be, have their attention diverted? We're going to be forced to deal with terrorism on our soil Inside. again. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the pro-Palestinian um, uh, protests that that are happening within the U.S. Um, let's talk about you know you had talked about you know which side are you picking, whose side are you on? 
you know, there's, there's a lot of turmoil going on right now in the United States, um, especially with uh, anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, where, where is this coming from? Because there seems to be a growing hatred around the world for Americans, period. And you're seeing it uh, in the media. You're seeing, um, you know, people in America supporting something <coughs> outside that, you know, is, it's bad. This is what generated Nazism. It's the same thing. Academia, people who can't do so they teach, <laughs> require accolades. In order to require, because they require accolades, they teach a philosophy that says academia is here, cavemen are here. And they then propagate those beliefs into our youth. Right. No different than Hamas is playing cartoons that teach them to hate Israelis, that they're less than human. What you're seeing is simply a ramification of those, of, of that last 30 years of that happening. Again, I, 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 am, I advocate for the abolishment of a Department of Education because I, decentralization is the only answer. When you hear centralized power in anything, run. Because you allow the few to control the many. So you think it's, uh, some of it's from indoctrination. I'm asking you where, where are these people coming from? So you have these pro-Palestinian pro uh, protests. Right? Yeah. The, uh, largely built of college kids. Maybe some of these are immigrants. Caucasian. Uh, a lot of rich, them. Rich. Some of them. Spoiled. Sure. With no direction. I Desperately agree. looking for something in which to believe. Correct. So you see a banner that says, from the river to the <clears> sea. <throat> which is a propaganda they're taught. Which is coming along with an implication that says, eradicate the Jews. Right which is 100% anti-Semitic. Absolutely. And yet these protests are going on within our universities. Some of these are propagated by the professors of the universities. They absolutely are, which is why tenure is a, what, what did we call it before? A, a, a weapon a, of the left. A weapon of the left. what you said. Okay. And, in, you know, here's a rare positive side. Let me give you the positive side. They really are a minority. And they're an un uneducated minority, among other things. Half of them were carrying, or some of them were carrying Italian flags, not Palestinian flags, and didn't know the difference. <laughs> okay? But well, I saw they, some of them carrying Taliban flags. Yeah, I did. Well, that too. But I'm talking about people that are so ignorant, they don't even know what they're carrying. They, don't, they didn't make the banner themselves. They don't understand what it says. They just want to belong in the group. But here's, here's an interesting point. Historically, the left has portrayed the U.S. as a racist, anti-Semitic country. They, they've said that the um, white supremacists, for instance, uh, are the evil people and they're, they're going to move against Israel or any minority, right? My bet, I put money that today those outlying factors call it any minority, call it any whatever, would ally to defeat this movement that's going on with the academia. Academia in that, academia does not teach. Academia indoctrinates. Let's define that. These are not teachers. These are indoctrinators. <clears throat> Those must be defeated at all costs. And there, we cannot move forward without doing that. The same as Israel cannot move forward without neutralizing Iran long term. It can't happen. Nor can Saudi, nor can some of the other countries that want peace. Why is the media not talking about that right now? There's, there's not a ton of, of uh, Where press. Do your reporters? What do your reporters have to do before they get a job in the media? <laughs> they have to go to a college and get a degree in media. Well, they used to. <laughs>
Now I think you can just go, you know, to the Associated Press and get a press badge and possibly be on so. your merry way. But the point being is they're 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 of one philosophy. They came through the program. Why do you think we're tr the current administration is trying to offer free college? Because more people get indoctrinated. Um, so that you you want to know why? It's because they all come from a leftist perspective after going to college. I had to deprogram my two daughters after going to Santa Monica College oh my. where they turned their back on the governor of California <coughs> in protest of him being a Republican. <coughs> you didn't send him to Hillsdale? He, yeah. <laughs> so I, again, I, I am so upset with the fact that we do not teach people critical thinking. We do not teach people to challenge, which it used to be what, what our academics were about. Challenge what exists. Question it. Debate it. Debate it. We don't have debates anymore. We shut debate down. Everything is the opposite of what it was. I'm beyond concerned. I think that the majority of this country is going to get to a point. If we do not take some political action soon, it's going to, it's going to turn into a, a hot war. I, I, I honestly believe there are people, I think Texas could secede because they have that right under treaty. And I think you could see patriots migrate to Texas. And I think you could see a civil war. I can see, here, here's the good part. Even if there wasn't a civil war, let's just say the people bisected or the center of the country became of one persuasion and the coast, the left coast and the other left coast um, <laughs> did their thing. The point is, is that they would not survive, even if we just bided our time, because they're parasitic in nature. They can only survive when they draw money and sustenance from the working class, which are the people that I believe are the majority of this country. I mean, there was a comment on our show I read the other day, which basically said, no, when you hire me, because I was advocating for responsibility and work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, they said, no, when you hire me, you're simply paying my time. I do what you tell me, and then I leave. And I said, well, you wouldn't be hired in my company <laughs> because I want somebody that wants a future. I want somebody that wants to build. I want somebody that makes me more money than I pay them. That's the nature of business. And they could not get their head wrapped around it, could not understand that concept. Well, being of service and being of value um, is something that's, I think, kind of the idea of it maybe has dwindled uh, lately. Why? Because they're taught that you are a, it's a hive mentality is what they're taught. You serve the greater purpose. You don't look for happiness. You don't try to achieve what you can be. You don't become the best you are. You <coughs> serve our needs. And the very queen bee somewhere in that hive that you've said, who is that, is calling the shots. And everybody else serves the purpose that that one generates. And that, in, in my belief, I mean, I'm sure there's somebody pulling the strings, but academia thinks they're in that group. That's why they're supporting us. We'll, we're the thinkers. We'll figure it out. Uh, you never have yet. Everything you've proposed has died a miserable death. Well, what happens when all that money goes away? So if you look at some of the, because uh, that's what holds it all together, right? Like, let's not kid ourselves. It's money. Once that money's gone, a big part of it. Then what? The host dies. Right. So you look at, uh, you know, look at um, some of these pro-Palestinian <coughs> protests that have been going on that have been ushered in by uh, university professors and academia. Um, well, a lot of their alumni are now pulling I their funding from these prestigious colleges. Yeah. So that money is going away. Um, Agreed. I, I, I think that's going to help. But I also think that the, if we were to strike, as we talked earlier, is, uh, or Iran, I think the signal lines that, that spark the demonstrations are going to fade. There'll be no group to belong to. Those academics will not have outside support financially. They'll be, be required to live on their merits, which there aren't any. <clears throat> there is an and alternative. They're going to have to work for a living. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, 
There is an alternative, and that is uh, if the funding from private sources dries up, goes away, yes, they can change and try to attract it back, but can they not also go to government and have government provide that which the market has not if we abolish the Department of Education, they can't. That's True. my point. It's a preemptive. Uh, I'm, I guess that's my this theme. This will be a battle. <laughs> preemptive strikes. This Cut off the supply a, line. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But what we're up against is an entire. This has been going on. This didn't happen in 20 minutes. This has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you have interdependent groups on the left. Shall we call it the left? Yeah. That. Uh, know the value of each other to their larger cause, quote, unquote, and their belief in their reaching for power. They're not going to just dry up and go away and say, oh, darn, you know, we didn't make it. Uh, the money dried up, so we've got to change. Anticipate resistance. Anticipate what the other side is likely to do to replace that which you are taking away, and it's not by their conforming to your command. It's by them resisting in other ways and finding a way to subsidize their resistance. There was just a report that China had, uh, had, had is starting to install, against the law, by the way, is it Confucius Institute or something like that? But it, 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 yeah. it's institutes it's next to colleges. On many campuses. Yeah, to indoctrinate. Well, they're next to military bases yeah. in the U.S. Um, K through 12, they're instituting, um, and there's a report. The report, I think, is called the Little Red Classroom. <laughs> um, but they are. They're, they're, these are strategically positioned. Uh, Indeed. I institutions some familiarity with that <laughs> infiltrating our K through 12 education system and we're taking the money which I still we've gone through the report we're digging some more I haven't figured out why we're taking money from China to fund our public school system it doesn't make any sense to <laughs> me I'm going to figure this out uh, eventually <laughs> I hope well, but you know, obviously, we know what their tactic is. Uh, we know what you know. We know where they're heading. We know what the the end game is if we let them keep doing it. So, we'll you know we'll rise up. We'll fight against that. But I, what both of you guys just tapped on supply line. I want to bring this conversation back again to, to Gaza. Tactics. Okay, <laughs> let's bring it back to Gaza Strip. And so, uh, Israel cut off uh, water and electricity mm -hmm. to the Gaza Strip and fuel. And fuel, so you know, which is uh, that's another thing you know that should be stated is that you know Hamas is getting billions of dollars uh, you know, every year to the tune. I think I don't know how many billions of dollars, but it's a lot. There's a lot of money going into Gaza every year, and supplies and aid. Um, and what what are they doing with it? Well, Hamas is building up their military. They're digging tunnels. They're, you know, they're, they could have been building an infrastructure with this money. Yes. They could have been supplying their own water system. They could have built their own power grid. They did not. They relied off of Israel to feed them that while they beefed up their military. Correct. That's not my, that's, this is not the statement that I'm making. I just thought it should be stated. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to ask is, is that the right tactic when you have two million people living in Gaza that depend on electricity, water, and fuel. Is that... Are is, you talking about Israel's tactic? I'm talking about Israel's tactic. And cutting off the supply chain to the entire Gaza Strip, you're, you're taking away um, resources from Hamas, from the terrorist group. You're also taking away from the Palestinians. And I'm not calling them both the same because I don't no, think they are the same. But I, I think Hamas I, I, is a, ter Hamas is you, a terrorist group. I do somewhat disagree with you. I think, tactically speaking, and again, that's what we're trying to focus on here. I think I'm it, not saying it's the right tactic. No, either. It, no, I, I understand that Israel okay. has is attempting to move the populace south. They are allowing varying degrees of supplies to get north. There are certain cutoffs. They're saying 
sorry, nothing beyond this. Why? Because that's where they're currently structuring. You know, they're going to they're going to flush the trash one direction. And I think what they're hoping, I, I've heard this being said by an individual, that by starving those supplies from the north, which is an isolated tunnel system, mm -hmm. that at some point they're going to negotiate because I don't care who you are. When you get hungry, you become compliant or you lash out, one of the two. Israel, I'm gonna, this is very harsh to say what I'm going to say, so take it for what it's worth. I'm speaking strictly intellectually here. If they lash out and harm the hostages, Israel no longer has a leash. If they negotiate to release the hostages, Israel wins because there'll be some compromise or, or they'll move in and clear out the rest, whatever it is. Even if they're dispersed, so maybe, maybe group by group, who knows? <clears throat> but what I believe their belief is, or the attempt, is to get to that point where starvation and water is a much faster yeah. lever, um, forces them to negotiate or to do something in which it opens, it frees their hands. Well, if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense for Egypt to open the, uh, what is it, the Rafah border? Yeah. The Rafah, uh, to let Egypt open not? this border and take in the Egypt Palestinian refugees. Because they know what that brings. Yeah. They... Well, and I also think probably Egypt doesn't have the resources in the north to take in two million people. They're not in The right U.S. Now. pledged the resources. So we did. Uh, that, yes. that was my next question. Why haven't we stepped we in and say, hey, <laughs> let's help out with Egypt taking on these refugees Egypt, and make this a simpler process? Egypt, George, none of them are stupid. Look what this group of people that have been given unlimited funds Well, they were funds Jordan and Egypt did. were both handed the keys to Gaza, and they both declined it. That's right. Who wants to manage that? But this is a different situation now. This is, hap like, this is happening right now. If we're, Egypt if doesn't we're, want if we're to afford a problem. Help, if we're willing to help, why won't Egypt step up? Because That's it, my question. Because why won't Egypt? Because it becomes their right. problem. Right. If the United States gets a new regime that, that chooses to do something different... Because what? They're, they're afraid that we're going to sit there for 20 years and then one day we're just going to say, no, that's enough and we're going to leave. I'm just saying that they're afraid and they also think long term. Because why would they... Long, but why would they think we would do that? Because the United States has done it just, historically. Because we just did it. That's correct. <laughs> Afghanistan. Yeah. You don't have to go very far. <laughs> That's why. So we can't expect anybody to take our word for anything. And I'll, I'll just say this. I am, as you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in support of this country 100%. I support the Constitution. I do have, I'm starting to have a little issue with the way we elect. I think we should go back to the original rules and laws. I think that the, the Senate should return to a, a proponent of the state, not an elected position. And I think that I have a problem with the fact that we can literally turn over a point of view for the country in every four years. That makes it very difficult for us to negotiate long-term agreements with other countries. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to cure that. I don't I haven't given enough thought even to have an opinion. But so I do it's see partisan that being a value, problem. It's partisan values holding up foreign policy throughout. Yeah, and, and that's why I think Congress has neglected its responsibility because that was the stabilizing force. <coughs> the Senate especially. But the Senate now is more concerned with getting reelected instead of representing those states and giving the states back the power they deserve. Well, I mean, that's always been a problem. Our government is stretched way too thin. This country, our government wasn't structured to run a country of 350 million people. It wasn't structured, it was structured, like you said, to be broken out that's right. state by state. Cool. It was broken out to be, uh, you know, it was built to be broken out into service not of Not a democracy, a republic. That's, that, that is correct. But that's why I think we need to get the Senate back to being an appointment of the state. Yeah. If you're a majority left state, your appointment is left. Yeah. If you're a majority right state, 
your appointment is right. But the state can recall you if you deviate from their policy. And that's what we're lacking. These people, these senators, they have no, they have no respect for the people that elect them. Once they're in office and they've got power, they do what is required to be reelected. They do what is required to, to give themselves more power. Well, I think allegiance is probably the word that you're Maybe looking allegiance, for. Maybe allegiance, yeah. There's no allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways. Well, Fred, let's okay. bring this back. One last question for you, you bet. to wrap this up. And this is not, like I said, an easy one. We've been talking about it for an hour. <laughs> what, is your, what is your best case scenario tactically to come out of this war? What, what has to happen from uh, Israel? What has to an essential happen from supply Gaza line and Iran? Is Hamas for what is going on in Israel now? I think Ken's point that Hamas must be a target, I quite agree with. Uh, that is apart from whether or not we have the will or the talent or the resources to do it in the current government of the United States. I think that uh, as an elemental military strategy, you must assess the battlefield and the enemy. Hamas is a critical line of supply and support for the enemy. To ignore that and to somehow set that aside is to uh, pass up not only an opportunity to correct the problem, but to misanalyze the situation. We must go after Hamas. As far as tactically on the battlefield, um, they designed those tunnels and took hostages for a specific purpose to make the uh, to make the battlefield very difficult morally as well as uh, tactically, and uh, it's it's got to be done. Do we have the will to do it? That's a very large question mark in boldface uh, italic. Do we have the leadership? Do we have the will to do what must be done? I don't know. We know we can describe what must be done. You've, you've, and it's going to require, because they have designed with, with a lot of thought behind it, there will be civilian casualties. We've discussed that here. There will be atrocity. We have discussed that here. Our intent is not to commit atrocity. Our intent must be articulated. It is to prevent atrocity. And the design that the enemy has uh, embellished over the, the battlefield is intended to produce very dramatic emotional um, response on the part of the people that can be characterized by, uh, by a faulty media, shall we say, and, uh, and elicit an emotional rejection of that which must be done to win. It's got to be done fast. It's got to be done thoroughly. We have to look at the, uh, the supply chain that goes to the enemy. We have to do all that we can to protect innocence, but not allow the holding of innocence to prevent that which must be done to win the larger battle. And uh, I, it's questionable as to whether we have the leadership here, let me say right now, uh, to do what must be done. Israel is in a life and death struggle at this point. But literally, life and death. Let's hope that let's hope this works out the right way. But it depends on each one of us to know the right thing and support the actions necessary to to do the right thing. Uh, I don't know. 
I, I, I hate to come up with that answer, but uh, it's, it's a very difficult tactical as well as strategic uh, uh, decision, uh, decisions that have to be made. If we make the wrong ones, if we mitigate our response, it will only add to the problem. It won't, it won't reduce the problem. It will add to the problem and to the innocence that will die because it's rewarding bad behavior. That's my response. Is that clear enough? Uh, it is. I mean, it's, a, it's an impossible moral dilemma at best. I don't <sighs> think you can say much more about that. I think... Uh, Requires character on our part. We're being measured right now. Each one of us. Yeah. Each of your listeners. This is a crisis. It is time to stand up, man up, and woman up, and do the right thing. Or we may not have an option in the future. Uh, whatever is done may be imposed upon us. Uh, and we may be yielding a, a future to our children and their children that um, if they're allowed to exist, which uh, will certainly be a judgment upon the world. And as we said earlier, uh, technology being what it is, if we lose this one, I don't know how we're going to be able to... Uh, to stand up and do it again. I, I hope your listeners will respond and rise up and do the right thing in the right way and pray that we win. If we don't, the world will be far less without us. I, I, I would just say this. I just got back from Auschwitz. <laughs> I walked it. I. Oh, my. The impact was such, and that was before this happened, like months, a couple months before that happened. I, to see this happening is one of the most frightening things I've encountered because I can't fix it by myself. This takes, this takes a national fortitude. And I, will, I would say also that a minimalistic approach is much like taking antibiotics for half the term. All you do is improve the bacteria. It right. becomes more resistant. It becomes more intelligent. It learns how to Finds get around the bacteria. Finds a way to adapt. Right. So I, I, don't, I think if you don't destroy the problem, the problem grows. I, exactly what you said, just in other terms. I, I'm going to close on that because there's nothing worse than I've ever seen it other than that tour of Auschwitz. I haven't seen anything that bad ever. And I don't want to live it. I don't want to be responsible for it happening again by not acting. Well, I think it's in you know it's in everybody's um, it's in everybody's best interest to act and do what they think is right. Um, I think that's you know that's all we can do, and and that's what we should do. I think, Fred, you're right. I think um, every single person um, has a responsibility to learn, understand, um, and try and comprehend what uh, information is coming into them um, and, you know, to digest it as best they can and to make, you know, the best decisions uh, on the moral ground. And to act. And to act. It's very important. So let's hope, uh, you know, let's hope everybody does that. Let's hope this, you know, uh, is an eye-opener um, for everyone to you know, to, to be active, uh, you know, and to know like what you, what you do, what you say, your vote, it counts. Everything counts with every single person. Okay. So Fred, thanks for coming in. I really Thank appreciate you uh, your insight. Um, you know, it's very valuable, um, especially to our audience, our listeners. Um, it was, uh, it's, it's been, you know, it was, a, a, a bit of a dire conversation that we had, but I think it needed to be had, and so I'm glad you came in uh, to speak. Glad to be here. Proud to be here. Uh, you have an eclectic blend of uh, intellect and, and courage in your audience and in 
in the panel here. It's just, uh, it has come to us now to act or not. It is our free will choice. I vote to act. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, come back next week uh, where we'll have more for you on America's Frontline.